Walter Wilson here, and welcome to Homebrewing DIY. On today's show, we're going to discuss Fermentrack. Fermentrack is a fermentation temperature controller that does a lot more than just temperature control. Fermentrack can do profiles, gravity, and some pretty amazing temperature and gravity logging as well. Stick around as Aaron Bandler talks with me about Fermentrack. Welcome back to Homebrewing DIY, the podcast that is focused on the do-it-yourself aspect of homebrewing. Contraptions, gadgets, and parts, this podcast covers it all. Today, we have Aaron Bandler on the show as we discuss Fermentrack. Fermentrack is a temperature controller on steroids. It's a pretty cool piece of software, and Aaron is going to discuss with us how you might install one yourself. Please support this podcast by using the support link in the description. With your support, any amount to this podcast helps it stay on the air and also helps us improve the show. And please make sure you rate us on your favorite podcast service of choice. Your rating and reviews help other brewers find the show. Before we talk to Aaron, I would like to go over some feedback. And I have feedback from Reddit user Marito Noir. I think that's his name, Marito Noir. Well, here's the feedback. Great pod, man. I'm completely new to the homebrewing game and found it really informative. The transitions between the segments are a little drawn out and the ad could use another take, but you've got my sub. Well, I just want to thank you. Uh, I want to thank you for the feedback and I also want to thank you for the subscription. I've already fixed the transitions of the show, so I hope that you enjoy them from here on out. And also... I re-recorded the ad. So once again, thanks for the feedback. Well, let's get started. Today, we're talking to Aaron Bandler about a very powerful fermentation tool called Fermentrack. I'd like to welcome Aaron Bandler to the show. Today, we're going to discuss Fermentrack, a fermentation control box for the Raspberry Pi using the ESP8266 ESP and or the Arduino. So a little complicated there, but uh, Aaron, welcome to the show. Those are, those are some things that I've, I, I've heard a little bit about, but those are all words that I've heard, but I'm not really sure what the, all those things are. So <laughs> That's actually awesome. So, sounds complicated to me. Yeah. So I, th- I think what we'll talk about today is kind of a brief history of what Ferment Track is. Well, let's talk about what Ferment Track is. We should probably then do a pretty beef, brief history on where it came from. And then we'll just talk about like ways I built mine and, and possibly have you ask questions because I know that you're thinking about building one as well. And then we'll, yeah, I'll give you definitely. some good tips on building your own. Excellent. Awesome. So, uh, what is ferment track? Well, ferment track is a really cool profile controller for a fermentation chamber. I have a fermentation chamber. I built one myself out of a dorm fridge and added a wood box to the front of it. And at first I actually had just your standard like ink bird controller that you would like tape to the side of your fermenter and then just kind of set the temperature and it would try to stay there. That type of temp controller like that you might use for your keyser or something like that. That makes sense to you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so now so the, but you can also do it without the controlled for without a uh insulated wooden box as well. You could this is something that would work in your basement as well just by itself, right? Yeah, like really, if you had heat and cool, this is going to work, right? So like, for example... Okay, so this is for my heat and cool. This isn't just for monitoring fermentation. This is actually for controlling it. Yes, so this is going to control it. So yeah, I've built out my fermenter the way I have, but you could just use a chest freezer, right? Or if you had an old fridge laying around, you could use Fermentrack that way. Uh, You could also, if you had a way... I've seen certain types of... uh, 
where people have like glycol pumps that run in through a wand that dips inside their beer and then they use a, a heat jacket for like heat and cool and then they don't really have it sitting in a fridge i've seen some pretty crazy okay I see. like that as so, well i i feel like i should let your listeners know that i'm currently at the stage where i'm monitoring my fermentation using a um a, a connected app and a device but i'm not yet at the point of controlling with heat and cool i still just let the basement do its thing but um it's important to me to be able to monitor where my fermentation is at and know when it's done so yeah that's the stage that i'm at but i'm interested in getting up to this controlled fermentation level with all these cool gadgets that you have yeah so that that's kind of like the next step right uh, a lot of people take the step where maybe they have a fermentation chamber already and they're just using a device like an Inkbird or an STC-1000 or a Johnson controller and you're kind of setting the temperature, but you're not really getting it super dialed, right? So uh, that that could be another use case. Um, and then your cool. case where you're still using it in the basement, but you have a, a tilt hydrometer which actually just like submerges in your beer and tells you what the temperature is and tells you what the gravity is, but it doesn't give you any way of controlling it. Correct. Correct. But it lets me know when I need to worry about it, which <laughs> that's, that's about all I do at, at that stage of the, of the process anyway. It's just worry. Yeah. 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 <laughs> no, I, I just check it religiously, but I have no control over what it's actually doing. Exactly. So this would give you that control. So, the way that it's kind of built, right, is that you have, I, I, well, we'll get into how it's built, but let's maybe talk about, like, the, let's start with the history of Fermentrack and how we got here, right? So the way it started sure. was there was a, a piece of software out there called BrewPie. It, it was made by a gentleman in Norway, and he had built this really cool device where you could take an Arduino Uno, and you could push a script from a web server on a Raspberry Pi and you would build out a board with some with a soldering iron and add temp temperature control probes to it and you would actually be able to control it with a PID algorithm that factored in the overshoot of your fridge and heat so the idea is that you can have really really solid temperature control using a thermo well so you have a stainless steel tube that dips through the top of your bung in your fermenter, and then it goes right into the center of your beer. And doing so, you would actually be able to have really dialed temperature control. It doesn't even move more than 0.1 degrees in any way, whether you're heating or cooling. That makes sense to you? No, I, I have, I, yeah, but I have my first question. So it sounds like this is the sort of thing that might appeal to, in addition to the hobby brewer, also the hobby electrical engineer and computer programmer is this something that is accessible like that that original case you just explained is that something that is accessible to the average brewer with maybe some technical knowledge but not um not necessarily the skill set to be building their own circuit boards and programming their own computers the cool thing about this is ferment track itself is a lot easier than the original brew pie was to build the original brew pie okay you, you okay. had Either way, you're going to have to bust out a soldering iron, but now you can have a little less experience to be able to do so. The old way, you had to kind of like build your own breadboard it out. You had to build your own like board with like solder and just like it wasn't pretty. Nobody really had the like pre-designed boards except for the gentleman who had invented it. And he was actually trying to sell those boards uh, for about $110 us but he was selling them in euros and you had to wait for it to come from norway it was actually kind of a pain in the butt to try to get one even if you wanted to that's kind of where that all started and that's actually where i built my first one i originally built my first system using brew pie and the old instructions and it was a, a pretty in-depth process to get set up a okay yeah the, just from the way you described it it sounds like the thing that to me would be more trouble than it's worth but if if it's as much easier now as you say it is then this definitely might be something that would be more in my wheelhouse. Yeah, totally. And and I would say that I wouldn't use the word it's more trouble than it's worth. Once you get it up and running, it works really great. And it's a pretty solid sure. piece of equipment. The other piece is that the gentleman who actually built the original 
brew pie got a lot of requests from home brewers that wanted it to do more than just fermentation. They wanted it to turn into a full brewery system and be able to do things like control mash temperatures in an electric brewery and oh, interesting. do hot liquor and all kinds of stuff, right? If you had a three vessel system. Wow. And so he wanted to add those features. The problem is, is that when you have an Arduino, it has a very, very small amount of memory. And so when you're trying to add all these additional features, he was running out of room and space on the Arduino to actually add those features. And so he moved to a different microcontroller. He moved from the Arduino and moved it into the Spark. And so the BrewPi Spark was the kind of second generation of BrewPi. I think it's at this point has moved on to a completely different project and the spark was a lot harder to integrate because it was a lot more proprietary than, than possibly the Arduino. And so it kind of just went its own direction going towards that full brewery system, but he kind of killed the legacy branch is what he called it. And that's kind of where ferment track picked up a gentleman on homebrew talk dropped a fork of brew pie calling and at the time it wasn't even called ferment track he then also added a different microcontroller called an esp8266 which is really cool because it also has wi-fi built right into the board and what it allowed you to do is a couple of things first of all my original brew pie setup you had to have a usb connection to the actual Arduino. So you had to have the Raspberry Pi connected via USB to the Arduino that powered the Arduino and also pushed the script down to it via a serial connection to the U- through the USB. So everything was essentially hooked up to your beer in a way. Yes, and it was all hardwired, right? And so one of the cool things that uh, this new version did is it allowed you to push it over your Wi-Fi network to the ESP8266 and therefore allowing you to actually be able to run multiple fermentation chambers with multiple ESP8266 from a single controller. And it's a pretty cool setup that he did that. It kind of started to add a lot more features into the system. And came a lot of customized PCBs, which are the actual boards that you were soldering to, that people had started to design, and you could just go online and buy five of them for like, you know, 10 or $15, and be able to have a custom printed board so that you basically could just add the ESP8266 to it, solder a few things with the, the, the a few components to it, and you didn't have to like, go in with a prototype board and make your own system and have everything connect to each other. It made the entire system a lot easier to set up as well. You'd still got to get a little hands-on with it, but as far as being able to do so, it made it a lot easier. That makes sense to you? Cool. Yeah. Yeah. To be honest, that's kind of when things changed to me and I took a lot of notice. One big thing about Fermentrack that I really loved was the web interface. What Thorak did, which is the gentleman that invented it, is he made a brand new web interface for BrewPy. So the script that is actually pushed to the microcontrollers is exactly the same, but he used a web interface that allowed it to interface with that script and other devices and did so in a mobile-friendly way. So it was super important to me. A lot of the times I was controlling it with my phone. It wasn't mobile optimized. It was really hard for me to make changes to my fermentation. And this way I could do so from my phone really easy. I actually hardly ever pull ferment track up on my PC. I usually am controlling it from my phone. And so that sparked me to do the install. And is there, I didn't hear you say, is there, is there a mobile app for it too? Or do you access it through the browser on your phone? You just access it through the browser on your phone. And you access it through your local network. So you just, you know, type, you name your Raspberry Pi ferment track and you go to ferment track. Oh, okay. I see. Yeah. It's pretty simple. One of the, now, can you do it from outside of your local network? You can, if you add a piece of software that allows you to get outside access, I use one called okay. remote it and I added that to my okay. raspberry Pi, and I can go to that website and then access it remotely. It is something where, unless I'm sitting at work and really want to just kind of sit there and watch my beer ferment, <laughs> I do know you, Aaron, and you would like to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's totally your style. 
but the idea is that you would be able to do so that way. The other cool thing is that how I built mine was all I had to do because I already had the web server running the brew pie software was I just formatted my raspberry Pi, went to fermentrack.com typed in the command to do the installation of the software and boom, it was up and running. I already had an Arduino that was running the script and got it to detect the script. I didn't even have to flash anything. It was really super easy for me to install and I was up and running. The one caveat to that is I am still running mine using my Arduino. And so I do still have to actually plug my Raspberry Pi into my full system because the Arduino doesn't run on Wi-Fi. If you were okay. to, oh wow, yeah, yeah. so if got you a were, lot of pieces there. Yeah, and if I were to do a new one, I have a, a whole box of 80, ESP eighty two sixty sixes. I would actually then just add it, but you know, I I kind of have one that's already working. So if it isn't broken, don't fix it. I, I guess the next step would be like where to find your own and how to kind of build one. I I would say the best place to start is on Homebrew Talk or go to fermentrack dot com. There's tons of uh, documentation there and it has a step-by-step instructions on how to build one so you don't really have to then be super intimidated it is actually pretty easy the the software to install on your raspberry pi is so easy that it's literally get your raspberry pi connected to the internet and then type in a single line of code in your command line and it installs all of the software it takes about 30 minutes to do so but it just does it all at once Pretty cool. That's like a like a Git or something like that. It does, but it actually does all the prerequisites as well. Installs everything. Okay. If I look here, I think the 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 line of code is curl dash l install dot track dot com pseudo bash. That's literally all. And it just type. gives you everything. It gives you everything. And that's all. Wow. Yeah. It even gives you the flashing software to push to to flash the software onto the ESP eighty two sixty six. So even that portion is built into the software on the Raspberry Pi. So all you have to do is connect to it via that flashing software and then push the script to it. It's actually okay. This is starting easy. to sound like something more accessible to me because I can I, everything that you just described I followed really well and I think I could totally manage that and um, and yeah I you know I can follow instructions and I can type a line of code and. Uh, as long as everything gets, it's, as long as it's kind of a, a, a plug and play type of scenario, I, I would go that it's I'm plug. I wouldn't go that it's plug and play though. So there, you know, the one thing is, is that uh, could, well, that would be no fun if it was just plug and play. That's totally true. Then it'd be too easy, right? Yeah. Then it wouldn't be homebrewing, right? Yeah, it's true, and it wouldn't be a DIY project, right? The other piece to all of this is that you have to realize is that that's just the software side. You still have to put together the the hardware. And that hardware is going to consist of an ESP8266. You're going to then add a relay to that that's going to have a relay that you're going to fire off to heat and cool that's going to go to a plug that you're going to wire to that relay because you're going to have low power going to that. And then, of course, the plug is going to deal with your full 110 volt. Outlet. Okay, so now we're getting to some, to, into some basic circuitry here. Exactly. So you're still going to have to build that circuit. That relay, you're, you're going to okay. have to break the tab off on the plug so that you have the two plugs don't aren't connected. And so, therefore, you can have one with heat, one with cool. Then you're going right. to have the relays connect to that. And then you're also going to have to have attach that ESP8266, at least two temperature probes, one for the fridge and one for the thermo well that dips down into your beer. I actually have three in my setup because I also have a temperature probe that tracks the ambient temperature of the room around the fermentation chamber so that I can kind of see how hard it's going to make my fridge work. I'm a little geeky on that uh, aspect. Yeah. But you don't have to have that. Really, two is the minimum. And then you're going to want to put it in some sort of box to kind of keep it safe so that it doesn't start a fire. And Okay, sure. Yeah. But the cool thing is, is that the instructions to do so are all on fermenttrack.com. Also, it, there's a, about there's actually two different threads on Homebrew Talk, the forum, that if you go there and actually search for fermenttrack, they both have really great support. If you go in there, you're trying to build one, you get stuck, you can hop on that thread, ask a question, you're going to get an answer really, really fast. 
I, I see them fixing and troubleshooting things for people all the time. I'm subscribed to those threads, and I would say there's probably 10 or 15 posts a day just back and forth for questions. Wow. So any questions on what you would do to set up one for yourself? Now, um, are there... Is it easy to find all these parts? Is this something that it's all, I can get them all on Amazon and there's a, uh, a concise list of the things or do I need to go to like my uh, a hobby shop in town somewhere? Like, is, are all these parts pretty easy to find, I guess, is the question. Yeah, the parts are super easy to find. If you don't mind waiting three weeks, the best place to go is AliExpress. You're going to get the best deals. You can get an ESP8266 sure. for $2, I think, max. Uh, wow. Yeah, and then you you're gonna need a small 4K resistor. I believe it's a 4K resistor, at least for the Arduino. That's what you need. It's actually, sorry, for the Arduino, it's a 10K resistor, and that part itself is a penny. <laughs> and then right. you're gonna need yeah. the PCB board, and there is a link in the Homebrew Talk forum for different versions of that board, and they order them from PCBs.io. And usually, I believe four boards is five to ten dollars shipped, and you get actually the setup to be able to do four of them from a single order. Wow! Yeah. So, what do you think is like the total equipment cost here for this so far? So, if you used a Raspberry, not including the fermentation chamber and any of that gear. Yeah. So, if you use a Raspberry Pi Zero, you that's ten dollars. You're looking at a few temp probes, which are about a dollar a piece to two dollars a piece, so that's about six dollars. If you're doing all of this from AliExpress from China, and then you've got, let's see, you've got to have the PCBs are another ten dollars. So we're looking at right now uh, an SD card, which is also another ten dollars to actually store the operating system. Two dollars and fifty cents mm-hmm. for the SP eighty two sixty six. So you're looking fifty does bucks. The, does the pot include its like power supply and everything? Yeah, you're need a plug. You need a power supply. So I'm thinking of around fifty dollars is the total cost for all of this. Okay. So very very. And about how long do you think it would take to put it together for somebody who's following steps online and tr- troubleshooting along the way and. Yeah, my f- um, maybe isn't entirely sure what they're doing every step of the way. Yeah, my first setup when I originally did the brew pie took me about four hours to do. Um, I breadboarded it okay. out first, and then I also then I went back and soldered it down. That was then. I think that if you had the the PCB board and you still want to breadboard it out just to make sure that you know you understand where things are connected and how it kind of comes together, and then once you do that, since you're not having to like make your own connections via like wires and solder. I've got to be honest. I think that the total install time for this could be an hour and a half to two hours. If, if you, if you follow the directions wow. and, 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 you know, had maybe somebody to help you or, or were very, very, you know, intuitive <laughs> in that way. Okay. Now, so now the other thing that I think you mentioned it earlier, but so this, this is really the control system for the heating and the cooling and, it sounds like you were suggesting that it also is can be used for monitoring. So, does it? What kind of devices does this connect to? Like, I know we, we mentioned the tilt hydrometer earlier, and that's the device that I use. But are there other devices that are available to actually monitor your fermentation and not just control temperature and things like that? Yeah. So it also interfaces with a project called iSpindle, which is a kind of do-it-yourself tilt hydrometer. You can uh, also find the guide to that on Homebrew Talk, and I believe we're actually going to do a show on that one in the future. Though I've never built one, we're going to try. Okay. To, we're trying to find somebody who has. It does interface with the eye spindle, which is going to give you that gravity reading and the tilt hydrometer as well. Okay. One cool feature that they just came out with in the last year, I think back in April, is it, it'll actually push all of the data because it's it's going to chart all this out. It's really beautiful. You're going to get a chart of your temperature over time, how much it's heated and cooled. So every time the fridge is turned on, every time the heater is turned on, that's tracked within the chart. It's also going to tell you the room temperature, 
the chamber temperature and the beer temperature is all different tracked lines. And if you have a tilt hydrometer, it's going to track the temperature of the ch tilt as a different line. And it's going to track the gravity as a different line on the axis and give you a, a really great chart. One of the cool things is that if you're using Brewer... Now, this is, the, this is the Ferment Track software that will do that. Yes, the Ferment Track software will do that. Right. And it gives okay. it to you from the web interface. But one of the cool things cool. is that if you're using a brewing software like Brewer's Friend and you're using that to log your brews, the Ferment Track will actually push data from your, ferment, your, from your Raspberry Pi via the API to brewer's friend and actually attach that to your brew log so it's pretty cool oh wow that's that is cool i have put in a request because i use brew father for my software i have put in a request to yeah i'm a beer smith guy myself yeah and i've i've put in the request to have it actually interface with brew father it's there's no real way it could work with beer smith just because Beersmith is a, a piece of software that actually is installed locally on the machine. Right. And so, right. It's not, yeah. Yeah. You can't kind of push your data from Ferment Track to the cloud. And that's kind of what you're doing. But still a really cool interface and, and really a great feature built into it. Other than just tracking and controlling your fermentation temperatures, it also is going to be a really great interface for your tilt hydrometer or eye spindle if you have one of those as well. Now I want to I want to talk a little bit about the system that I have just so we can compare yeah what I'm currently using to what you're describing cuz it's quite a, it's quite the one or two levels up but so I have the tilt hydrometer and it when I'm doing a beer it'll be in my basement and I may or may not have it in a swamp cooler type setup depending on the temperature and what beer I'm trying to make but anyway I I have the tilt hydrometer and I definitely think that that's a really good product and I've gotten really good support on that when I've needed it from the folks over at Till Hydrometer. Uh, and it's definitely something that has uh, helped me level up in my brewing. In addition to that, I think that the app that the, the actual Tilt Hydrometer app is really lacking in its functionality and also it's just its stability. So what I have is I actually have to park a old iPhone that I don't use anymore. I actually am borrowing it from a friend and it sits plugged into the wall uh, within Bluetooth range, or I guess it's on Wi-Fi. It, it's, uh, no, it is, it's Bluetooth, right? And so it sits about, I don't know, within 10 feet or so from my beer on the wall, and it's, it's getting the gravity and the temperature pushed to it every 15 minutes or whatever. And then within the um, Tilt Hydrometer app, they, they, they came up with a little Google Drive, uh, Google Sheets, um, I don't know what you call it. Uh, so uh, basically a spreadsheet that they developed that has all the underlying code in it that allows you, it just collects your data and it pushes it up to a Google sheet and it charts it all out for you and it gives you a little report on your thing. So it, it, it works when it works, but I found that um, the stability of the app isn't great and um, it, I've, it crashes a lot. So I've rarely had a beer ferment to completion without some sort of interruption in the data stream there. And that's really my biggest complaint with it is that it's just a little clunky to have to park a phone within Bluetooth range and then have to trust that it's going to stay connected to the cloud service and to the Google drive and be pushing everything up constantly. And it just really, I haven't really seen that it's able to consistently do that. Um, so it's, what, from what you're describing, it sounds like the ferment track is the way to go there. But based on the setup that I currently have, I would probably have to still have the iPhone parked nearby. And really what makes the difference here is having the Raspberry Pi with the E, what did you call it? ES, ESP8266 ESP. microcontroller. They need to come up with a better name for that. Yeah, it's it's a Raspberry Pi. I can remember. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally, it, it, totally. But the ESP eighty two sixty six is just a, a, it's just a small like microcontroller chip. Once you start messing with one, you never forget the name. Sure, that makes sense. But anyhow, so it's it sounds like for from where I'm at, even without going to controlled fermentation, because that's a whole other project, right? Building the fermentation chamber and yeah, getting the 
depart and that that's it that's its own project that i'm sure you'll do a uh a, an episode on at some point as well but um even with the setup that i currently have it would probably be a pretty nice upgrade to switch to the live data stream to to switch my live data stream to the ferment track as opposed to trying to do this whole relay to google drive through an old iphone that's plugged into the wall and constantly has an app running on it so that's, you know, even at the level that I'm at, I think this is something I'd be interested in just to have the stability of monitoring, even if it's not actually controlling anything yet. But there's, you know, there's always the option to improve from there, I suppose. Yeah, or you could do even a more simple setup, which is, you know, like, for example, if you had a pump with an ice bath that ran into the, I, I saw a system down at the homebrew shop the other day and it wasn't that expensive. I was surprised, but it's basically a tube that you put into an ice bath of water and it pumps the ice bath of water in through a steel tube down into the beer and track. Oh, interesting. It's like an immersion chiller in a way. Exactly. Except for it's, it actually uses that to cool your beer and then that with a heat wrap and then you wouldn't have a fridge at all. Right. I I've seen setups like that. Right. Okay. And that's one way of actually controlling temperature and doing so without having to have another fridge in your house. But to be honest, the easiest way to do it is, you know, go on Craigslist, get an old chest freezer and then attach a ferment track to it. And then you're going to have the control as well as the logging. And I got to be honest, once you have temp control, you never really want to go back just because you understand how that's it's kind of super what I figure. The other, Yeah, yeah, no, definitely. And that's, that's definitely someplace I want to get to, especially as I'm trying to branch out my styles, my beer styles, and the seasonality of brewing it too. Like I have difficulty brewing certain recipes at certain times of year, as, any, as does anybody who uses ambient temperature for fermentation. And so it, there's a huge draw to do that, but it's, it seems like more of a project than I want to take on or currently have time to take on at the moment. The chest freezer, I think, is the way I would go if I were to decide all of a sudden that I wanted to do this in a weekend. Yeah, and the good news with that is is that really if you've built a ferment track and you had a chest freezer, there is no other work. Right. Because the chest freezer, unlike I know that you built a keyser, unlike your keyser, that was a multi-day project, wood, paint, the whole deal. You're not going to have to do not any to of mention that. it cost about twice as much as I thought it was going to cost. Oh yeah, of course <laughs> you you go in going I'm going to do this for three to four hundred dollars, and then you figure out just based it's on like the tubing bucks. and the and the and the keg parts <laughs> alone that those were exactly what you thought the whole project was going to cost. Well, yeah, I mean, once when I I when I bought tubing before, I bought three feet of it, and it's you know just a couple bucks, but then all of a sudden I was buying like forty or fifty feet of it, and it was. Uh, you know, over a hundred dollars just for tubing. Yeah. Anyhow, that's a different conversation. Yeah, totally. And you don't, and you didn't realize that like, Hey, I, I, you did the setup where you had multiple, multiple, uh, uh, regulators and that alone is hundreds of dollars. So yeah, Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So this is going to be a lot more frugal if you just do it that way, because the idea is that you're not going to have to make any modifications to the fridge. You're just going to plug it in. And if you have like a heat wrap for your, for your heater, that just plugs in. And so the idea is that the the real money is in the controller. And to be honest, it, right. you know, the, with the parts and everything, it's really priced out at what, 20 bucks more than, and a little bit of time more than the ink bird, which is I think around 32 to $35. Yeah. Maybe I should get my wife on here so that you can explain to her how economical this is going to be. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, hey, that is something you have to do on your own. <laughs> okay. <laughs> if you want some more information and you really want to just look at Ferment Track for yourself and you want to dive in, the best place to start is fermenttrack.com. That's where you're going to get all of the documentation. You can really see what's involved. And if you have any questions, obviously you could uh, you know, email me. I'd be glad to answer any questions you had. Also, the other part I would say is that if you are 
really looking for full-on support, you can always go to Homebrew Talk and, and search for Ferment Track, and you'll see a, about two or three different post threads that are geared around it. And they're super helpful and very responsive and able to really help you get it dialed. That's cool. So there's a whole community of guys who are talking about this all the time. So yeah, that's why I love open source. It's yeah. like everything else on the internet, right? You yeah. can just dive in and find everybody's already kind of been through this before. Exactly. And plus it's open source software. And so it's really supported by the community and they do a really good job of, of helping each other out. Uh, of, of all the things that I've built, this actually was one of the easier ones, but looks really complicated. <laughs> <laughs> So well, especially when you start rattling off all the names of all the parts, you know, that's, but, um, I'm sure once you get the hang of it and start putting things together, it's actually quite simple. It is, it is, you know, and, uh, it, it wasn't as big of a deal as, as a lot of people think it is. Maybe I'll move forward with this project once, uh, once my basement starts to get a little too cold for ales in the winter time. Exactly. And, uh, then you can start really making loggers and have all the stuff. Yeah. Well, I, well, I'm in the I'm in the temperature range that's sort of right between the two in the winter, so maybe something like this would be helpful to get me into both styles. Exactly, exactly. Well, thanks for being on the show, and uh, we'll definitely have you on again. Thanks for talking for Mentrack with me, Aaron. Of course, thank you. Once again, I'd like to thank Aaron for taking the time to be on the show. And please note, if you want to follow us on social media, you can search for the podcast on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. We're all under the handle of Homebrewing DIY. And if you like the show and want to give feedback, you can always send an email to podcast at homebrewingdiy.beer. Once again, that's podcast at homebrewingdiy.beer. If you want to leave a voice message for the show, there is a link in the description. It's a pretty cool feature, and you never know. We might actually play it on the show. Last, if you'd like to support our show, please use the link in the description. Any amount helps, and it helps keep our podcast going strong. And thanks for listening. We're going to see you next week on Homebrewing DIY.